Alexander. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5. We continue looking at the book of Galatians. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The opening verse of Galatians chapter 5. The question of freedom. Uh, one to particularly consider in a year where we have gone through such things as lockdown. Who would have thought we wouldn't have been free to sit on a bench in a park here in Sydney or to go to Bondi Beach. One of my favourite films uh, regarding uh, this theme, I've mentioned before, Shawshank Redemption. <clears throat> and uh, it's set in a prison. There's a quote from that uh, film which runs, I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. Their feathers are just too bright and when they fly away, the part of you that knows it was a sin to lock them up does rejoice. Being locked up goes against the grain. Are you familiar with George Orwell? Do you know where this, which book, this quote comes from? All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Of course, being or this one, Big Brother is Watching You, 1984. Both books dealing with this issue of what we're allowed to do and the notion of liberty. In Animal Farm we have the quote, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. The film Minority Report is a Steven Spielberg sci-fi classic based on uh, one of the books of Philip Dick, a sci-fi writer. Uh, but one of the, the, the issue of, of freedom and of privacy comes up in that film. And I read some comments by Spielberg on this theme after I'd watched it some time ago. And he said, the most striking thing for me was the fact that uh, George Orwell's prophecy really comes true, not in the 20th century, but in the 21st century. He said, what little privacy we have now will be completely evaporated in 20 or 30 years because technology will be able to see through walls, through rooftops, into the very privacy of our personal lives, into the sanctuary of our families, and these violations will, I think, be a detriment to society. And Spielberg went on, we have identifications that actually read your eyes. Everything will be identified. Advertisers will target you. A billboard will read your eyes at a great distance of 200 yards and directly project both sound and visual imagery. At one point I would have thought, 20 years ago, if I'd been reading, that's fanciful. It's not, is it? In fact, on the day that I read that, I came across a Sydney Morning Herald article entitled Google's Dirty Secret. And it unpacked similar kind of comments here and now, and that was about 10 years ago. In that paper, uh, I read this com about computers. Computer speed and flexibility offer us as users the illusion that they somehow set them free to explore, investigate, innovate. The illusion of freedom is just that. Well, computers and networks in fact record and therefore control every action of every user. Perhaps a little bit broad, but I tell you what, I start looking at what comes up on my computer and I'm going, how does it know that? I had this eerie experience once over in the office. I just type one letter and then it's pulling up what I was going to write. I had no idea, it was like a new computer, I didn't know how. I went home. Spoke to my wife about this. Freedom. Our world is very different to perhaps, well, certainly to what we grew up in. In Galatians chapter 5, there comes an attack upon the early Christians in this area known as Galatia, what we term around modern day Turkey. And the attack is upon their assurance of salvation captured in the notion of freedom. 
In some senses, Galatians 5 verse 1 summarizes the last two chapters, indeed, you might say the whole book. Paul declares that they have this freedom. Here is the meaning and ending of the Christian life. Not, though, political freedom, or the way we often think about freedom, though it may be symbolised by such things, such as in the story of Acts chapter 16, where there is this great release from the Philippian jail that occurs, no, there is a deeper issue of freedom that is being spoken about. It is our very identity in Christ. For there will come a time where Paul finds himself in jail, and yet he will still know freedom. Freedom that is ultimately the knowledge that there is no condemnation. When you are indeed a son of the Father, picking up that adoption theme we looked at recently, adopted in Christ. And so Paul begins here in chapter 5 with two commands, stand firm and do not submit. Freedom has an enemy. We are drawn, tempted to justify ourselves, to use uh, the law in various ways, and the biggest way is in the notion of uh, legalism. What is legalism? Uh, the commentator Todd Wilson defines it. Legalism is treating that which is good as though it is essential. Whenever Christians turn something valuable into something ultimate, legalism is at work and freedom is forfeited. On the other hand, we preserve our freedom in Christ when what is essential to God is essential to us and everything else is kept in its place. One of the massive dangers of churches is to become legalistic. It's a danger of religion, doing things on the outside. You see, church is, is all about, we want to be doing what is right. But very easily that moves into being seen to be doing what is right. And the line becomes very subtle to step over. Churches become places where legalism takes over and so they become toxic places. Societies too can be places where this happens. You see it happening in our time. There is such a rising in people saying what is right to do and the swift pointing of fingers and blame and we find ourselves moving into a society where freedom is lost. Legalists lose sight of what ultimately counts. They start thinking that non-essentials are essential. They begin to insist that good things are in fact necessary. And the result is that they look accusingly on anyone who would act otherwise. In Galatia, back here in the first century, there is this group known as the Judaizers, who are putting pressure on the new uh, converts to the Christian faith putting pressure on them to return to the Old Covenant, a covenant which was signified by circumcision. We're not told exactly what they said, but if you uh, look at Acts chapter 15, verse 1, we're given an indication where we read, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. We heard a similar theme in the reading that Ian brought to us from Acts chapter 21. Notice that circumcision, going back to the law of Moses, was uh, what was being uh, debated at that time. Well, these people came into this uh, new church at Galatia and they heard this message and they were shaken up. They were uh, wondering, what, what do we do? Is this what we've got to do to be saved? They wanted salvation. And so here was someone, a group who were saying this is the path and they lost sight of what ultimately counted as they moved to get circumcised. And Paul uh, cries out to them, stand firm, do not submit to a yoke of slavery. Well, what is at stake? In verses 2 to 4 we see when we allow legalism to set in and we return, return to slavery, then we lose Christ. The death of Christ becomes of no benefit to us. In seeking spiritual benefit elsewhere, the achievement of the cross is put aside. Listen to verses 2 to 4. Look, 
I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who will be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. In, speaking, in seeking this spiritual benefit elsewhere, the cross and its achievement is being lost. If they take on circumcision, this smallest thing as it were, then they might as well go the whole way, says Paul, and embrace the whole law, that is, to become Jews. But to do that, then we see in verse 4, to do that will mean they are cut off from Christ and they fall away from the grace that Christ offers. We see here the, the trap of legalism. If we try to do it all ourselves, we will be left to fend off for ourselves. We will not have Christ's blood, we won't have Christ's life, and we won't have Christ's grace. All we are left with are our petty, sinful, dissatisfied selves. If you were here last week, I spoke on the parable of the prodigal son, but I remember focused on the elder son as well. And that picture of being petty and, and caught up with yourself is the picture of the elder son. In the parable of Luke 15, it's a sign that we have lost sight of what ultimately counts in the Christian life. It's when we begin to lose the joy of living the Christian life. George Whitfield uh, and, and the Wesley movement, when they first began, I've been reading a biography on the Wesleys, they had an incredible desire to be uh, honouring the Lord. And they were absolutely dedicated. They'd get up earliest hours of the morning and they'd be uh, meeting in religious devotion. And there was this incredible moral striving that they had but no joy. And then there came a transformation, effectively a new birth. George Whitfield himself commented on when he was eventually converted, he said, God showed me that I must be born again or be damned. I learned that a man may go to church, say his prayers, receive the sacrament, and yet not be a Christian. Paul shows here that if they return to the law, that is using the law to kind of get there themselves, then everything that Christ has done is, is cast out. They cut themselves off from him. So then, what, what does ultimately count? Well, chapter 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. I began with freedom. The question is freedom from what? If you look up uh, uh, freedom and uh, type in quotes on freedom, there's this enormous range of, of quotes about different types of freedom and what we're to be freed from and so on. But here in Galatians 5, we need to recognise what Paul is talking about when he talks about freedom. Legalism is certainly one uh, version. Uh, it, specifically in their, in their context, it was to actually go back to the old covenant, the law. That's what we've been really at the heart of the debate. But ultimately, what Paul is recognising is it is freedom from the accuser trying to make our way to God on our own efforts, seeking assurance in places that cannot be found. We are driven by insecurity, by guilt, the wrongdoing that we have done. It drives us in different ways, we're all different in how we react to it, but it lingers there. And there's all these kind of ways that we are seeking to either cover it, deal with it, seeking to justify ourselves because 
we know there is a coming judgment. We see it expressed at every level. People are often oblivious to it, but they set up their, their systems and they make themselves secure. They kind of set up their own little judgment system and say, oh, this is what I'm doing. And then, then they look at others and point the finger in judgment on the way they're living. The Galatians were being pressured along those kind of lines in their own day. And so the question is, what ultimately counts and what doesn't? Nothing is more important than crystal clarity on what ultimately counts. We stand firm in freedom and don't submit to any such system or law or legalism. Your assurance does not lie in you. What ultimately counts, well, Paul spells it out here in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Notice what Paul is saying. In the first half, he hits the core of the issue. It is their pressure point. It is circumcision. That captures the Jewish law. That's what these new believers were being unsettled about. But now, it's, it's probably not a topic that's going to unsettle us today, though living in a Jewish area, it certainly could be an issue for those in our neighbourhood. But now Paul says, now there is a different perspective. Everything has been changed. Why? It's captured in the key phrase, in Christ Jesus. The Galatians have heard the gospel and discovered the truth. Truth which revolves around who the Christ is, who is Jesus. It is Christ Jesus who has dealt with our sin and the problem of the law. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, a page back, and you'll see in verses 19 to 20 how Paul sums it up. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so there is the base of Paul's argument. Where does that leave circumcision? Or uncircumcision for that matter. Frankly, says Paul here in Galatians 5 verse 6, it doesn't count for anything. When it comes to the big picture and ultimate reality, which is to do with where we are before God himself, in the final picture it is your standing on the final day of judgment, which is the only thing that really counts. Do you take heed to that? That what really counts is where you are on that final day of judgment before Him. That's what really matters. Where are you in that light when the accuser will bring all his accusations? And what Paul recognises is that's, that's there in the future, but now in Christ. Here in the present, the truth has been revealed. We can stand with assurance for we are justified, declared right now. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what he has done. He gave himself for me, for you. And now that truth is here in the reality we receive by faith that will be revealed and vindicated there in that final day. It is to know the one who has dealt with our sin, the one who has set us free, Christ Jesus himself, having faith in him, therefore, is what counts. And that truly sets you free in the mess and muddle of our lives. Faith in Christ brings freedom. But what does that faith look like? Well, Paul makes clear that it isn't simply an empty faith as if you just say something which has no bearing on who you are. You come into the church and you get up and go, oh, we're going to say what we believe, the creed. We stand up and we just mouth it off as though that's it. Or on the other side, you actually may 
be able to go through the, tr the creed and tell me, explain all the truths about it. And sometimes I meet someone who's so zealous uh, for the, the faith and they've learned it all that up as it were. They've got all the knowledge there, but there's something deeply missing. Because the only kind of faith that matters is faith working itself out through love. Faith in Christ expressed in love. Love for God and love for others. In fact, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 19, we have exactly the same um, start to this verse. Uh, Galatians 5 verse 6, uh, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts, but then it concludes but with the phrase, keeping the commandments is what matters. That's what it is to be living out your faith, it is to be living in love. And here is a wonderful secret to the Christian life. I often come back to this, this phrase as I think about my life and what I'm doing. We're surrounded by people proclaiming all kinds of things. This is what we're to be doing. This is how we are to be living. And I go to Galatians 5 verse 6, faith working itself out in love. My son was uh, learning at school and uh, began talking about rubbish disposal and he showed us a video of a family in, I think it was uh, Tasmania, who became, uh, uh, very much becoming self-sufficient. They recycle everything. They're living the simple life. Now, there's nothing wrong with the basic principles, but it's where it goes. I was kind of left with this another layer of guilt as I'm telling my son, of course it came up in the timeline, tell him, just take out that load of rubbish you know, and here's this family who seemed to be able to manage for five years to only have a small bag of this much rubbish to throw out, and we're throwing out, you know, you know how it is. And I listened to this video, and this lady said, oh, it makes us feel good. The corollary being that everyone else is listening, we're all feeling guilty. The next project uh, that he had to do was the scale of poverty in the world. When you start moving into that sphere, you quickly feel overwhelmed with guilt. And though I was struck as I looked at it by the fact that when it looked at the different categories, the very bottom level of poverty in the world was kind of like what this self-sufficient farm uh, family were doing in Tasmania. Uh, it seemed ironical because the whole drive of the poverty issue was to get people out of that kind of situation scenario. And I kind of, my son didn't pick up on these tensions, but I sort of, oh, I could move on to plastic bags. We dealt with, uh, plastic bags and so on, but then the virus came along and suddenly we've got every plastic screen in the, the world around us. It, it's a, it, it, the, you know, how do you, how do you live in this world where you're told one, do one thing, do this, do that? Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there aren't questions here that we need to grapple with and often good things to work through. The problem occurs when we turn such things into ultimate things. We turn good things like circumcision into the ultimate thing. And people are constantly doing that out of their own insecurities and becoming judges over all and all the time forgetful of the one who is the true and ultimate judge of your life and of my life. I've listed some society issues, but it becomes a huge thing within the church and those who claim to be taking the, seriously the Bible. Uh, Wilson comments here, Christians might not insist on such issues, but we might insist that water baptism ultimately counts, or our political views, or the kind of church we go to, or the view that we hold on some interesting point of doctrine. We're tempted in all kinds of ways to turn good things like circumcision and even being uh, faithful to the Bible into ultimate things. And here's how Wilson drives home his point I've modified it in some ways what he said. Neither premillennialism or amillennialism ultimately counts, but only faith working itself through love. Neither Arminianism nor Calvinism ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Neither Anglican nor Presbyterianism ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Yes, I did say that, but don't tell any Presbyterians. 
Neither traditional hymns nor contemporary music ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Neither teetotally nor enjoying a glass of wine ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Neither voting Liberal nor voting Labour all of Greens or whatever ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Neither six-day young earth creationism nor old earth progressive creationism ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Neither pre-tribulational rapture nor post-tribulational or even mid-tribulational rapture or whatever tribulational rapture you might deeply subscribe to and profess ultimately counts, but only faith working through love. Do you get the point? Perhaps you ask, so don't any of these things matter? Now, Paul isn't saying that we shouldn't care about things. and There are plenty of issues that are important. We need to work through them. And that will involve conflict and dealing. But we need to recognise that it's the Spirit who leads us into all truth. And here is what is critical. It is the issue of faith, and that's the truth in Christ. And that faith works itself out in love. If these two don't go together, then we have missed the entire point. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, if we have not love, we gain nothing. How do we work that out in practice? Well, the temptation is, well, on one hand, not to want any conflict, but if you profess faith in Christ, you will come into conflict with a hostile world and issues within the church. That's what Paul is facing here in Galatia. We are called to stand for our faith, for what we believe, to contend for the faith, but having declared what we believe, we let them live that faith out in love. I assure you that is easier said than done. It's the work of God in our lives, the Spirit showing us where our security truly lies, where hope is. And that is exactly what is said in the verse that I skipped over, verse 5, the final verse for today. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. It's vital for us to live with the big perspective, knowing who is the judge and that you face final judgment before him. And keep your eyes fixed on that final judgment and our Saviour who has saved us from the condemnation there. That puts everything into perspective. But no, the less people think about the final judgment, the more they are tempted to treat what's good as though it were ultimate. And that's what we see being played out at so many levels in both church and society. And so whenever we're tempted to turn something good into something ultimate, we need to ask ourselves, what good will that do at the final judgment? That is, what does the King of Kings think about? Is it faith working through love? And if it's true, then how do I work it out in love? That will help us stand firm in freedom and avoid turning, returning to a yoke of spiritual slavery expressed in legalism. And so in verse 5 we have here living in light of what ultimately counts. Perhaps living in light of the final judgment can seem somewhat overwhelming for you. But Paul's message is to recognise the freedom we now have, having been declared right, justified in Christ. This is the path of freedom. Through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. We had that reading in 1 Thessalonians, and it touched on faith, hope and love. And here we have in verses 5 and 6, hope mentioned in verse 5, and faith and love in verse 6. There it is, that wonderful triad. And a hope here expresses the hope of righteousness. What is righteousness? It's that notion of things being in the right and good order. This is the magnificent biblical picture of hope that the Bible portrays, that God who does right is going to put all things right and our very stance about Jesus being the king will be vindicated. Nothing is going to stop that. And how is Paul so sure? Because at the cross... The world declared it is over. But along came Sunday. And 
and the righteousness of God was revealed. Jesus raised from the dead. A new creation has broken open. And so we have real hope. And how do we go ahead now? We have the Spirit. The Spirit of the risen Lord. And we are part of that new creation. How? We live by faith. Through the Spirit. And that means waiting, trusting in God, holding fast to that hope. It means I'm set free from trying to prove myself to God, to make my own way to his kingdom. All those legalistic things we can be told we're to do, all has been done for us in Christ. You know that truth. You know that truth deep down and you are set free. And we are now waiting for him to bring it all to completion, believing in that. How then do we live? We live eagerly waiting for God. He is our hope. Only the Lord can put everything right. Look at this world. Only He can do it. And that means also on a personal level, He's the one who can sort things out for you. We live by faith, trusting in God's promises. We live through the Spirit, relying on God's power. Are you worrying or waiting? Are you striving on your own or resting in God's work done in Christ? Are you depending upon your own resources or trusting in the sufficiency of Jesus? Do you know what ultimately counts, not only in this life, but on the last day? I have with me a little photo that was sent to me during the week from a minister, in, a retired minister in Bathurst. And in the photo, there is a picture of Winston Bilas, Bilas in her university days. And it's drawn me back to uh, this minister knew Winston at, at university and teaching college. And it drew me back to remember Winston. I close with a reflection upon her. It's two years to this month that her terminal diagnosis came through. It's a poignant memory. I think about, thought about that time in August, two years, 2018, and Winston had just started getting news that her health wasn't well, and I sat down with her at the back of the church here after the service. And I shared with her, she shared what was coming up, the uncertainty ahead, the treatment that she had. And I read Psalm 61 and prayed for her. She was troubled, but she received that word in faith and the Spirit. She and I had no, and I'm sure those of us here, I mean, she looked well that month on the whole, on outwardly. I certainly had no expectation that within two months I'd be standing here at her memorial service. But it was that fast. But Winston, as she had done in her time here, lived well. And in those two months, she died well. Because she knew and held on to the truth that freedom is found in Christ. The coming day of judgment came quickly, as it were, in August 2018, for her. But I saw a woman whose faith was worked out in love, standing on a hope who is Christ Jesus, our Lord. That knowledge still brings me great joy and example of encouragement for all of us. Let us pray. O Lord, you have given us wonderful freedom in Christ. I pray that your Holy Spirit will draw each one of us to know that deep truth so 
so that we would not be afraid. That in Christ we have refuge, even as we come to that final judgment day. And Lord, if there is anyone here, anyone feeling uncertain about all of that, Lord, I pray that your word would indeed find that person and meet them, that they might know the freedom found in Christ Jesus and live to his glory. Sing the song, It Is Well With My Soul. <laughs>